Welcome to the weekly podcast from Harvest Ridge Church in North Ridgeville, Ohio. Our heart's desire is that you would grow in your love and devotion to Jesus Christ and that these messages will strengthen your daily walk. For more information about our church, visit us on the web at www.harvestridge.net. In case you don't know, uh, my name is Pastor Matt. I am the youth pastor here. And uh, so uh, Pastor Kevin, uh, you know, a few months ago, once again asked me to fill in for him this week, um, except this time. So I preached a few weeks ago in February, um, and he gave me, uh, you know, it was part of a sermon series. Uh, but this time he said, you have free reign. And it is dangerous to tell me that I have free reign, all right? Um, who knows what's going to come out of my mouth? My wife never does, um, you know. <laughs> but um, so I wanted to talk through something um, that is a biblical understanding, a Jesus-centered understanding that totally changed the way I view and I go about life. Um, and I kind of wanted to share that with you all today. Um, so you're going to find out a little bit more about me, um, a little bit more about my story. Uh, but really, um, I'm just going to be open and honest with you because this is something that has deeply impacted me and I wanted to share that. And if it helps you as well in your walk with Christ, then it's a win-win. Sound good? So we're going to go ahead and get into this. And so we are, um, I named this sermon, Live Alive. Um, and so if you couldn't tell, that song was all about um, living alive. You know, until I rise up resurrected, I'm right here, right now, alive. Um, and so we are going to be talking about what does it mean to live alive. Um, and so what does it mean to be alive in the first place? Yes, it does mean that you're breathing you're um, existing, you're living, but I truly do believe that there's more to being alive than just existing. Um, and so here's a few different stories of times in which I felt alive. And so we have a few photos up here um, for you. And so um, as you can see, the first one, that is my daughter, that is Fallon. Um, and she uh, makes me feel alive, in, in, in all honesty. Um, she is so precious when I get to hold her, um, when she just gets this big smile on her face after I'm done feeding her or whatever, and she gets all giggly. It makes me feel, I, I don't even know how to describe it. Any parents in the room can sit there, and when you looked at your child for the first time, maybe not the middle child, we all understand how they are, but, <laughs> but you, you look at your child and you hold them and you say like, I, I don't know how I could ever love anyone more than I love you. Do, do you understand? Um, and, and I'm just now beginning that journey. So I can only imagine how it's going to be. It's going to tune down during the teenage years, I'm certain. But, you know, it'll, <laughs> it'll amp back up. Um, but so, you know, holding her for the first time, I felt alive. And another time is that second photo that you see. Uh, that was me in uh, Flagstaff, Arizona. So I spent a summer as the um, activities director in 2000. I want to say 17, um, it might have been 2016, I spent um, six weeks working with all their camps. They have six weeks of camps. Um, and so on the weekends, I would go and do different adventures. And one of them was uh, going to Flagstaff, Arizona. And we um, had one of the friends that I made there, he invited me to go with his family and ride four wheelers, quads, um, on the mountains that they have. And so they had um, volcanic ash mountains that were cut in because of all the like, you know, raptors and razors and all the four wheelers and dirt bikes. And so there would be mounds that were like 20, 30 feet high that were at a, like a curve. And you would go and you would drift the curve and you're going about 35 miles an hour through trees, just drifting. Um, and I will tell you, I have never in my entire life felt more exhilarated and alive than I did in that moment. Um, another moment is on, on that same trip, um, there was an incline about that steep. And I'm like looking, we stop at the, at the front of it, and my buddy goes, all right, we're going to go up it. And I'm like, we're going to do what? And he's like, yeah, we can go up it. And I can see that there's a trail where people had gone up, but I'm like, I, you know, I haven't really ridden this intense of a dirt bike ever, or uh, of a, of a four-wheeler ever. And he goes, all right, pop it into second gear, lean over top of your handlebars, and you'll just get up the mountain. And I'm like, what if I lean back? He's like, well, you'll fall, but, you know, it's, you know, it's not a big <laughs> Nothing says feel alive quite like near death, right? <laughs> um, so yeah, we end up doing that. I, you know, I get up first gear, second gear, third gear, fourth gear, fifth gear, and I'm flying. Then I'll, I drop it back down. That way I can get up because I had to build up speed. And I'm leaning over top, and I can feel my momentum 
start to like go back, but I'm still cruising up, but I can feel the weight of the gravity that are hard rocks behind me. Um, and I end up making it up. And so what I'm saying though is that is a time in which I felt exhilarated. I felt alive. Um, and then a last, a last story is I have many adventures with my wife in which I feel alive, but one of them that I really like is um, we just took like a quick three-day trip uh, to Niagara Falls. And I remember um, the, in the afternoon of a Saturday, I believe it was that or Friday, uh, we walked in like downtown Niagara and it was just us two. Um, and we were just walking and, you know, we ate at a nice restaurant and we just adventured and explored. And there's just something about, you know, being with my partner, being with the one that I am spending the rest of my life with and just enjoying life with her. Um, and I just look back at that and I feel alive. And every single one of these moments, I look back fondly. I look back um, and it, it brings joy to me. Does it, I, I can say, there are people in this room, you have stories like this, right? Where you can look back and you could say, I, I can pinpoint that moment, I felt alive. And when I think about it, it brings me joy. Can, can I get a show of hands? Do you ever, do you have a moment like that? Okay, good. I just want to make sure that we're on the same page uh, because if not, then you're going to have a hard time with the rest of the sermon, all right? But <laughs> so there are times in our lives though in which we feel alive. But at the same point, I think everybody can understand that there are times in our lives in which we just feel like we are existing, like we are just living and we are just trying to get through the mundane. We are just trying to get through the week to be on the weekend. We are just trying to get through it. Um, and I believe that that is actually a flawed way of living according to how Jesus created us to go. Now, I'm not talking about highs and lows. Um, of course, you are going to go through times in which you have some great highs and you have some lows. That's, that's not what I'm discussing. Um, I can acknowledge that. And, and what we're actually talking about is we're talking about a concept of not allowing the lows to be as low, um, not allowing the highs to be the thing that you search for and look for constantly, because that's where we often find addiction. You know, you're constantly searching for that next high. Um, what we don't want to do is we don't want to always be searching for that high. What I want to do is I want to change our outlook on what it means to live as if we were truly alive. All right. So um, getting through all that, this is um, the scripture for today. It is John 16, 33. So if you wouldn't mind standing up with me, we are going to read this out together. Um, and this is kind of the central idea for what changed my entire worldview. This is what changed it all. So John 16, 33, if you wouldn't mind reading this out with me. I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world, you will have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the world. Let's read that last line one more time. I have overcome the world. Jesus, I pray that you be here in this place today, that we would recognize you as the conqueror above the world, and that you would help us feel alive and live as if we are alive. Thank you. Amen. You may be seated at this time. So... This is the, or sorry, can you go back to that verse real quick? This is the verse, um, like I said, that changed the way that I view life. Um, when, when we truly have an understanding of, I have overcome the world, it, it changes how we live alive. And so, um, like, like I've been talking about, I want you to live as if you are alive. I want to live as if we are alive. And so what's one of the worst things that gets in the way of us truly living as if we are alive? Um, the biggest thing that I can really think of is fear. Um, now, I'm not talking about fear as in um, fear of spiders or maybe fear of heights or fear of babies. Um, you know, every single one of those are totally understandable, especially babies, they're creepy. Um, no, I'm just joking. <laughs> no, the problem that I have with babies is I always feel like I'm gonna break them and I don't wanna break someone else's kid. I'll break mine, totally different. But you know, like I don't wanna break your kid on accident, you know what I mean? But uh, that's not the kind of fear we have. You know, you have phobias, you have different things that you fear. Are they pretty much irrational? Yeah, but we all can recognize that our fears are pretty irrational. Uh, maybe they came with a traumatic, you know, experience. That's not what we're talking about, though, okay? Um, I'm talking about some fears that are inside of you. Fears um, like fear of missing out, fear of death, um, maybe fear of... Um, 
you know, mis- misunderstanding, fear of failure, uh, fear of the uncertainty of your future. Has anyone ever felt a fear like that in which it's almost like crippling, in which you sit there and you go, I don't know how I'm going to get through this. I don't know what I'm going to do. I don't know what the future holds. These are all uncertainties. And um, actually, with... Um, with the youth, we've been going through a book called Screw Tape Letters um, on Wednesday nights, and it's by C.S. Lewis. And one of the things that he talks about um, is that God works in our present and he works in eternity, where the devil works is in future, because future has not happened yet. It is open for things to happen. And by us trying to guess what the future is going to be, uh, we actually are walking straight into a trap that he sets for us. God works in our present lives. Yes, he sets us up for the future, but he works in our present. And then above all, he works in the eternity. And so uh, C.S. Lewis talks about that. And so um, there is a real fear here um, of failure, of death, of the future. Um, and this really gets in the way of living as if we're alive. And so First John 4.18 says this, there is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not, perfected, has not been perfected in love. Perfect fear casts out, or sorry, perfect love casts out fear. We don't want perfect fear up in here, right? Um, no, perfect love casts out fear. Um, what does this mean? It, it means that if you are still fearing, and by the way, um, I, I still deal with these things. I'm not going to sit here and say that I'm perfect in it. That's the last thing I'll say. Um, but I think every single person in this room can understand those feelings. And if you're still feeling those feelings, um, then it simply means that we have not been perfected in love because that fear has not been casted out. Now, you know, how we go about this, I'll talk about that later. But in all honesty, like, it just simply means, according to this verse, that we have not been perfected in love. Um, but also, the Bible says that Jesus is love, that God is love. And so, um, to, to, to understand God's love, to understand Jesus' love 100% means that um, if we're still fearing, we don't fully understand the love that Jesus has for us. Um, and and this, is, this is a very interesting distinction to make because, yes, we can all understand that Jesus loves us, but if we're still having these fears, these anxieties, these, these worries, then there is, maybe it's half a percent, maybe it's one percent of us that still does not fully understand the range of Jesus' love for us, and it's not driving out those fears. Does that make sense? Let me, let me, let me illustrate this for you. Um, I can't speak for the ladies in here, but I'm assuming that most of you have felt this way before. But um, I can almost speak for 99% of the men here. At some point, at some point, especially if you grew up in a Christian household, you got down on your hands and knees, and you said, Jesus, please do not let me die and please do not come back before I've been married and had sex. Am I right? All right. Please do not come back before I've been married and had sex. <laughs> yeah, all right, all right. So at least a handful are honest enough to say, I was 13 and, you know, just an awkward time in my life. And no, all right. Here's the thing. Um, that, sorry, if you have baby ears, we have kids that, they don't talk about sex in there. But, um, so, <laughs> just cover them up. No, I'm just joking. But, um, here's the thing. It is an understandable fear because that is one of the pinnacle of pleasures in life that we are taught, right? That is one of the, the top most, utmost, thing. <laughs> we, got, we have a happy wife over there, all right? <laughs> 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 I see you, Matt. All right, so anyways. <laughs> oh, my dad's going to kill me. Ah. <laughs> All right, so getting back on topic. No, we are taught that sex is one of the top pinnacle pleasures in life. That is what our culture tells us. That is what life tells us, right? People get addicted to it. People strive for it. People want it. And so it is a completely understanding feeling to feel like if you're not having that pleasure that you're missing out on something, right? Especially as a young, immature age, um, it is a perfectly understandable thing to fear not getting that pleasure, all right? And so um, 
I'm not saying that I don't understand where this fear comes from, where this fear is driven, uh, but it is definitely a flawed understanding because at the end of the day, um, if Jesus' love, if eternity that, that God promises us, if that is so much better than any pleasure, why would we ever want to stick around in a world that is full of torture and torment and trouble? Lots of T's there. Uh, torture, trouble, torment. But why would we ever want to live in a world that is full of that in order for small pleasures when we could be looking forward to an eternity that is full of life and, and full of a relationship with God. Now, I'm not saying that I don't understand where this idea comes from. I definitely understand it because I myself have felt that. But do you guys understand that there's a flawed reasoning there? There is a flawed reasoning because we fear the uncertainty. We fear eternity because we don't fully understand it. So what we do is we try and grasp of these small pleasures. And what it does is it actually builds a, a fear um, and a mistrust in God because we should be able to trust Jesus that <laughs> that eternity is going to be a great time, right? We should be able to trust that, but there, there's a slight mistrust. And so um, actually what the, one of the lines of the song that we sang earlier says, um, where fear and faith can collide. And at some point we have to recognize that Fear and faith have to collide in our lives. At some point, they, they go head to head. They bash each other. They, they are like two opposing, or two opposing football teams. They will collide at some point. Um, and where does fear and faith collide? And I believe personally that fear and faith collide in a relationship with Jesus. Um, that is where they collide because Jesus, a faith in Jesus directly confronts fear. Um, and so um, I don't want I don't, I don't to spend too long on this, but I want you to understand um, that at some point you are going to have to understand and embrace the fact that if you're constantly living with fears and anxieties for the future, you are not fully trusting in Jesus. Um, and so what I, what I wanted to, um, hold on. Oh yeah, getting back into uh, John 16, 33, it says, I have told you these things, so that in me you may have peace, and in this, in this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. So where do fear and faith collide? Where do they meet? Um, they meet and, or sorry, they do meet in life, but at some point we have to realize that Jesus has already overcome all the fears of this world. He's already overcome, he's already conquered those things in our lives. He has already beaten those things, and if we have a true faith and a true love and a true trust in Jesus, then our faith in him should overcome those fears. Does that make sense, everybody? I, I, I wanna make sure that, that we're all on the same page moving forward, because if you don't understand this, then it's gonna be hard to live a life as if we're alive. Um, Jesus' love covers us and gives us freedom from the things that are weighing us down, um, the things that are burdening us, the things that we're carrying around. Jesus' love gives us freedom from those things because he has already overcome the world. He's already conquered. Um, and so this means that every day, instead of waking up um, as someone who worries, you can actually wake up and say, I can conquer because I serve a God who already has conquered. I can conquer because I serve a God who already has conquered. That is a massive change in mindset. And I, if you get nothing else from my sermon today and you say every day from now on, I'm going to wake up and say, I can conquer because I serve God who already has conquered. I think that'll change your life right there. Um, but so now that we understand how freedom works, now that we understand that there's a freedom in God, in Jesus, um, we need to learn how to live alive in that freedom. Because if you don't know, um, you know, just living or just living in freedom is pretty useless if you're still going through a mundane existence. Wow, you're free to be tortured. I don't, you know, like, it is not a, a, a fun concept to think, okay, now that you're free, 
be free. Um, <laughs> sorry, Beck. <laughs> sorry, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> that is a line from Beck Shinsky right there. She always says, be free, whenever you drop something. Um, sorry, can I, can I tell a side note? This totally has nothing to do with my sermon. Um, so I don't know if you guys remember a few years ago, we were doing, like, we started the gluten-free, and I was in, cha- I was in charge of passing out the communion elements. Um, and so I had, like, the gluten-free, and I would just walk around and always do the, the gluten-free. And at one point, I was walking, and so I I was a goalkeeper um, my entire life, and one of the things that I learned was just a quick reaction is if I'm dropping something, um, I knock it up into the air. It saved my phone from cracking many times. You know, I'll kick things, you know, that kind of stuff. And at one point, I was walking with this open bowl of communion elements, and I was right there, and I was walking, and I lost grip. Not, not that bad, but I just lost grip, and my initial reaction was smack it. <laughs> And I smacked the communion elements and the gluten-free went. <laughs> it was like LeBron James was back in Cleveland, you know? Like it, it was like that. And the gluten-free went everywhere over in this corner. And there were like a handful of people who were like helping me pick up. And my sister was in the front row. She was an intern and she was losing her mind, like losing her mind. And meanwhile, they're all up here. You know, the band, my, my dad, they're all up here. You know, it's a, like a, you know, it's a communion time. They're, they're being very serious. And I'm like, you know, <laughs> trying to... So that's what I think of when I think of be free, you know, like, be free. Uh, <laughs> but w- without, with that freedom, th- that's actually a great illustration. I didn't even plan on that. Uh, we are like those wafers. Have you ever felt like a wafer floating in the wind, wanting to start again? Uh, <laughs> that's a Katy Perry song. All right, everybody say, Pastor Matt, bring it back in. Thank you. All right. All right. I just want to make sure. <laughs> I'm glad you all feel that way. All right. <laughs> so, without, <laughs> without, <laughs> with, <laughs> we're going to be better second service. All right. <laughs> yep. Uh, this, this is my warm up. You guys are the warm up crowd. All right. So, uh, just because we have freedom does not mean that we know how to live alive, all right? Um, And so, like I said, the goal of today is to get you to live as if we're alive. And so, uh, 2 Corinthians um, 3.17 says, Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. I love that song, you know, where the spirit of the Lord is there. There's a reason I don't uh, lead worship, but um, here's the thing. Where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And so I want to make a case for you that freedom to live alive is found in the Holy Spirit. Freedom to live alive, not just existing, not just going through the motions, not just getting through the mundane, the freedom that we can use to live alive is found in the Holy Spirit. Um, and so earlier I told you some stories of the times in which I felt most alive. Um, you know, th- th- those are times in which external sources, my, my wife, my, my child, um, you know, and ATV, those, those times made me feel exhilarated alive. But I saved some of the most important moments, actually the most important moments, um, for, for this part, because I, I want to make a case to you that freedom to feel alive is found in the Holy Spirit, and the times in which I have felt the most alive, hands down, without a doubt, are when the Holy Spirit has given me his power and his presence, when, when the Holy Spirit has spoken to me and moved through me and worked in my life, those are the times in which I have felt the most alive. So um, Arizona, that same week, or uh, sorry, that same camp time. Um, I don't know what happened. I don't know why I got to this place, but I remember having fears and anxieties and worries, and I'm in the back praying during a service. Um, And by the way, I was going to like, I think it was like six evening services a a week, typically, all right, for six weeks. That is a lot of services. You would expect at some point I would just get bored, and I did definitely get bored. But um, at some point... 
you would expect, like, I would just zone out totally. Well, it was towards the last few weeks. I think it was in, like, the fourth or fifth week. Um, and I remember just being in the back, and all of a sudden, um, I always love to say this, when the Holy Spirit's presence floods, um, it is like a sack of bricks just thumping me right upside the head. That is what I felt in the moment. I'm in the back. I'm praying through my worries and anxieties and fears. And I remember the Holy Spirit just hitting me like a bag of bricks. Um, and I lose my mind, all right? I am back, I am weeping, I am, I am sitting there just in the presence of God. I don't know what to do. Um, I'm actually supposed to be a leader at this camp. There's only a handful of people who technically are higher than me and they're busy doing other things, they're busy with students, so I can't go talk to anyone, so I'm like, I need to call my parents. So I walk outside and I am weeping, I am, I'm sitting down, um, I'm sitting on a bench outside and just staring at the ground and there's like a little ant colony. Um, this, this is just what I remember. And I'm talking to my parents and I'm talking about how insignificant I am compared to the almighty creator who is God. And I remember sitting there and talking and, and, I'm, and I'm going, I'm looking at these ants and I'm like, I am like an ant before the Lord almighty. Like I am less than this compared to God. And I, and I just remember sitting there and I'm talking through them and they're just listening. They're, they're not saying anything. And um, my dad was just like, well, I believe that you're in the presence of the Holy Spirit and we're gonna hang up and you just need to embrace that. And that was a moment in which I felt alive. And another moment, if you don't mind me sharing a few stories, like I said, this is very personal for me. Um, Another one is uh, three years ago at youth convention. So I have a calling in my life um, that I believe God has called me to um, lead the 99 while he sends and searches for the one. Um, that is something that I feel directly God has called me to do, um, is to disciple and to lead the 99. And so uh, about three years ago at youth convention, we brought 82 people to youth convention, um, which was insane. All right? And I was, once again, losing my mind because... 82 people in downtown Columbus. Do you know how stressful it is? Um, especially considering 70-something uh, of them were teenagers. <laughs> All right. All right. That is incredibly stressful. Trying to get food for 82 people is ridiculous. You know, trying to make sure that no one gets lost. We had kids running up to homeless people, and I'm like, get away from them, you know, like that kind of stuff. And I remember sitting in service. We finally get everybody seated, and um, I'm, I'm in the back, and I'm just sitting there going, Lord, why have you called me to lead the 99? I can barely handle 82. Um, and, and this is a metaphorical 99, right? Like this is, a, this is a literal 82 compared to a metaphorical 99. This is basically saying you're gonna be taking care of all the people while I'm searching for that one. Like that is a daunting task. And I remember sitting there and I was talking to um, she's a Youth Alive director, uh, Liz Clark. I remember sitting there talking to her and I'm going, how am I supposed to do this? And she was like, only with the power of God are you going to be able to do this. And so that was another moment in which I just entered into a time and presence of the Holy Spirit. Um, I'll share one last story because I know you guys are probably sick of hearing about my life. But um, so a few months ago, I was sitting in my office. This is totally by myself. And um, I'm prepping for a sermon. It's a Saturday afternoon, and I'm finishing up a sermon. It was a busy week, so I didn't get to work on it during the week. And I remember sitting there and saying, like, this is what I feel like you want me to talk about. And I feel like I need to say this as well, but I have no idea how these things connect. I have no idea how to end this. And I remember sitting there, I'm just like, all right, I'm going to put down all my stuff. I'm going to step away from my chair, and I'm just going to spend some time worshiping Jesus. That's just what I'm going to do. So I'm, so I'm walking, and one of the reasons why that first song is so near and dear to my heart is because um, I was listening to King's Kaleidoscope just through the album, right? I was listening through the album, and um, it ended up playing into another album which had that song on it. And so I'm just sitting there praying, and I'm like, I don't know what to do, I don't know what to do, I don't know what to do. And then all of a sudden, um, that song comes on, and, and I start listening to it. And once again, it is like the Holy Spirit hits me like a sack of bricks. Um, and I feel like pressure and like the Holy Spirit drop in my office. And if, if you've ever experienced 
the, the presence of God in a way in which it is so powerful and overwhelming. Um, there was nothing, and sorry, I, I don't say these things to say like, I'm holier than thou. I, I'm so much better because God speaks to me. That's not what I'm trying to say. These are a handful of moments in my life. You know, you know I've lived 26 years and I'm only telling you a handful of times. And I just immediately get down on my face because I don't know what else to do. I'm in the presence of God and I have nowhere else to go besides the ground because the weight of God is, is so much more than, than I could ever anticipate. And so I'm sitting there, once again, weeping, putting my, putting my head on the ground, bowing, and, and God is speaking to me through um, the fact that I need to live alive, that, that I need to live as if I'm alive, and this is what the students need to hear. And so I'm just working through this. Now, what I want, what I want you to, to all understand um, as I tell these stories, they may sound like, that does not sound like a fun situation for you to be in. You are weeping, you are face on the ground, you are sitting there with uncertainties and anxieties. Um, yeah, I was, and they were the moments in which I felt the most awake and the most clear-minded and the most um, understanding of God's plan in my life than ever before in my entire life. I have never felt more alive no matter, you know, not on the top throw dragster, not on, uh, you know, uh, the wedding night with my wife. And in no point have I felt more alive. Sorry, I shouldn't have, I shouldn't have thrown that in randomly as like a, as an example. All right, I apologize. But <laughs> yeah, second service, second service. We got this. All right. Messed myself up. <laughs> At no point through worldly means, through worldly pleasures, have I ever felt more alive than I had when I found freedom in the Holy Spirit. That is something that I cannot fathom. It is something that I cannot explain. Why do I feel the most exhilarated, the most alive? Like when I think about this, like I have chills right now because I think of the presence of the Holy Spirit. Why do I feel this way? I feel this way because there is power in the name of Jesus, there is power in the presence of God. And so Romans 8, 11 says, if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, right? So if the spirit dwells in you, he who raised Jesus Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through the spirit who dwells in you. So because of Jesus' spirit living in us, because he is dwelling in us, because he is with us, we have life in our mortal bodies. That is something that I don't want you to miss. I don't want you to miss out on an opportunity to experience the life-giving power of Jesus Christ. Um, and so for some people who were not raised in the church, some people who were not raised with an understanding of who the Holy Spirit is, um, the Holy Spirit is you know, part of the Trinity. And if you, if you want to find out more about the Holy Spirit, take our essentials class. We talk an entire day about it. Um, but I, what I want you to understand is that um, Jesus gives us the Holy Spirit as a gift. And, and that's what happens um, in, in the New Testament. And it still happens to this day. And there is nothing more like living alive, or sorry, there's nothing like living alive in the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit. So this is what we're going to do. Um, the band's going to come out, and I wanted to intentionally spend some time here giving you all a chance to ask the Holy Spirit to work in your life. Um, if you have never felt the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit, you, you're missing out on the freedom that he can give you. And so what we're going to do is uh, the band's going to play, but if the altars will be open, you can stand, you can sit, you can kneel, whatever you want. But I truly want you to understand that you have to lay down your worries and your anxieties and your fears at Jesus' feet. Um, you have to understand and trust him. But at the same point, you also have to invite the Holy Spirit to say, come and do with me what you want, because without you, I'm nothing. Without you, I cannot live alive. So if you want to live alive, ask the Holy Spirit to come and work in you. Ask the Holy Spirit to come and give you life.